The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, folks, and welcome to today's webinar. This is Dr. Charlie Hall at Texas A&M University. I'd like to welcome you. We've got an exciting topic and an exciting speaker, so I'm just delighted that you're here. Let me, first of all, I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize our sponsors. A couple of sponsors, the Southern Risk Management Education Center has been a longtime sponsor of this webinar series, as well as the Texas Nursery and Landscape Association. So a big shout out to both of those sponsors. Appreciate the support in sponsoring this particular webinar series. If you look at the, uh, the way that everything is structured today, we have, um, uh, there, there's a control panel in which you can operate yourself um, in order to uh, manipulate the audio and the video for you today. So when you, when you take a look at your screen, you should have a control panel there on the right. So you can actually change how you interact with the webinar based on that control panel. That orange arrow, if you click it, you can open and close your control panel just like that. And then also, if you want to make it bigger, you can make it full screen. That's also a good option. And then if you have difficulties in hearing any of the audio, you can always use the telephone to hear the audio. So if you run into difficulties there, that's a good way to handle that. So just click on audio setup, click use uh, telephone. It'll have the dial in number as well as the pin. You just dial those numbers and then you'll be in the, the conference again for only from a telephone standpoint, not your computer. Now, you also have a chance to submit some questions. Now, I have everybody's microphone muted because not all microphones are created equal, and sometimes there's a little feedback. So to eliminate that, we mute everybody, but you can ask your questions throughout the webinar by just typing them in the questions box in that same control panel. If it's, if it's minimized, you can just click the, the arrow or the carrot beside questions and open that up and submit those questions, and I'll try to ask our speaker those questions as we go along today. Now, there is going to be a Q&A session at the end, so any questions that we don't get asked or answered uh, during the session, you'll have a chance at the very end to ask those questions as well. Now, I'll mention it now, but I'll also mention it then. There's a very short evaluation survey that's at the end. It'll take you about 46 seconds to fill out. So I appreciate your input there. It helps us get an idea of what resonates with you in this webinar series. And lastly, everyone, whether you attended today or not, is going to receive an email with a link on how to view the recorded version of this webinar series. What we have found is that a lot of folks may have had a conflict during the day, but then they can uh, view that after hours or anytime they want to because it's available 24-7. Or if you're here today and you want to refresh your memory or share it with others, by all means, feel free to do so. All right, today's speaker, the great friend of mine, a talented agricultural economist, Dr. Marco Palma. And Marco is an associate professor and extension economist here at Texas A&M University and has a, a PhD from Florida and very talented uh, in terms of consumer behavior research. And Marco's got some exciting things to tell you a little bit later on about our new human behavior lab here at Texas A&M. So Marco is going to talk about our topic of the day is seeing inside the mind of the consumer. All right. So Marco, let me change the presenter over to you and then you can take us away. Thank you, my friend, for that nice introduction. All right. Um, you should have. I control. appreciate you. I appreciate you joining the webinar today, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some interesting work being done in the area of behavioral economics and neuroeconomics in particular, and trying to understand a little bit better the mind of the consumer. And in doing so, I'm going to try to highlight a few points through the presentation, maybe two or three things that you can take back to your businesses and in terms of ideas that you can try to implement. And so the, the first thing I'm going to do is just a brief introduction about the brain. Why is it important for us to look at the hardware 
and uh, and a little bit about the biology of the of the consumer and how that might impact the decisions that they make. And in doing so, I'm going to highlight very briefly uh, uh, some of the key areas of the brain that are responsible for decision making with an emphasis emphasis in uh, buying different products and what uh, different benefits and cost consumers typically look at when they evaluate products. And I'm going to end by looking at some of the current work that we're doing in the Human Behavior Lab um, with uh, Charlie, Louise, and other colleagues uh, literally around the world. And I'm going to finalize just by providing you a little bit of a summary. So we have these very uh, uh, long view of the consumer that it's uh, it's inherited from neoclassical economics and in neoclassical economics it was a period of transition where we went from a very descriptive uh, theoretical background in which economics relied mostly in essay type of theories to include mathematics and one of the legacies of this period is the idea of this rational consumer and essentially what that means is that but consumers uh, typically act by looking at the benefits and the cost of a decision and those benefits and cost uh, are weighted and only when the benefits are higher than the cost we take certain actions. Now we all know of course that if that was the case we will never overeat or we will save enough money to retirement. We will do all the things that uh, sometimes we complain about in terms of um, in terms of um, some of the, the things that, that are perhaps considered not optimal behavior. So along came two psychologists from Israel, Kahneman and Tversky, and they revolutionized the field of economics because they um, use a lot of ideas from psychology to try to explain why people do what they do. So the interest that for economists had been up to that point about prediction, and it didn't really matter why people did what they did as long as we can predict what they do. Now the process in which people make those decisions became uh, important. And so this legacy of this decision making, you can think about that as spoke or, or the Vulcans in general, that they have, first of all, consumers have perfect information and they use all of the information that is relevant to them. So they, when they walk into a nursery uh, or uh, a retail uh, setting, whether it's in a grocery store or any other garden center retail, for example, they use all of the information that they see, they process perfectly, and they update the benefits, they update the cost, and then they optimize their decision making based on those two things. Well, in reality, we have, as human beings, we have very limited time. We're constrained in terms of the cognitive resources that we can dedicate to evaluate different actions. So we don't necessarily look at the whole, uh, the, all the information that is present in labels or any other signs around the garden centers. So this is what this presentation is about. It's trying to, 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 uh, to, sh to show you in, in brief, how is it that people make these and process these decisions about how to buy different products. Now, in general, when we talk about the brain, uh, even though the brain, the brain is one of the most complex structures known to men. And even though it only weights about 2% of the weight in the human body, it uses nearly 20% of the energy. That's how important it is. And we had this very romantic concept about the right side and the left side of the brain, one being more quantitative and the other being more creative. Well, in reality, we've learned more about the brain over the last 10 years that we have in, the, in, in history. And we know that that's not necessarily the case, but I think that this provides a very useful way for us to try to understand different parts of decision making. It's almost as if we have two different cells that are making decisions. One that is more patient and it's more methodic and it makes decisions thinking a little bit more carefully. But the other part that is a little bit more impulsive and it acts on the moment and it doesn't think things thoroughly that much. And so we can think about us human beings, whether it's in a consumer setting or in any other setting, having these two uh, selves interacting at the same time. And then, for example, making a decision, uh, my brain is telling me that I'm not supposed to buy this watch because I don't have the money. It's too expensive. But you know what? I deserve it and I buy it. And so it's as if these two cells are interacting with each other and uh, in making the decision process. The frontal lobe and the prefrontal cortex is the area of the brain that really distinguishes us from other 
intelligent animals. And there are certain areas of the brain that are particularly important when it comes to making decisions. I'm not gonna go through, through uh, a biology class here in the webinar because that's probably not that relevant, but at least there are certain areas that have been linked with people processing benefits, with people processing cost, and then with people actually making the decision process and making this evaluation of the costs and, and benefits. In particular, the ventral striata or the nucleus accumbens is an area of the brain that has been linked to people looking at the benefits. Uh, the, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and other areas of the prefrontal cortex are generally linked to the actual decision-making process. And the insula is normally uh, linked to um, cost associated with the decision-making process. Now, one of the early experiments, we're talking about uh, the early 1980s is known as the Libet clock. And in this Libet clock, it's interesting because you can watch this dot move around the, the clock. And what Libet did was actually quite simple. He asked subjects to move either the left index finger or the right index finger. It didn't matter which one, but just to make your mind and move one of the two uh, index fingers. Now, what he discovered was that there was a, a lag between when the brain activation started and when the action of moving the finger actually took place. In fact, there was almost a little bit over a half a second difference between the activation of the brain and the movement of the finger. So the question here was, when do we really decide? Is it when we move the finger or is it 550 milliseconds earlier when we made up our mind and our brain decided which finger we were going to move, and then the rest was just a mechanical process of the brain to actually make the movement happen. So this is to me what really opened up the door for us to question uh, a little bit more into uh, trying to understand the biological process of why is it important to look at the brain when we make decisions. In this classical experiment, Knudsen separated different products and, uh, and what they did is they gave consumers very simple uh, slides. And you can see here for the first, they only show the product. In this case, it's showing a Godiva chocolate, but they actually showed uh, hundreds of products. But the important feature here is that they showed what, what you can qualify as the benefits of the, of the product. Because here in the first slide, they're only looking at the chocolate itself. So it's supposed to engage in some activity related to um, the benefits of consuming the chocolate. Then in the second part, they show in addition to the chocolate, the price. So you can think about this as adding the cost component to it. And then in the third phase, they show people the slide in which they were supposed to decide whether they were going to buy the product at that particular price or not. So in this process, they divided and they found, as I mentioned earlier, that the different parts of the brain that are competing in terms of processing the benefits, processing the cost, and then making the actual decisions. So this provides some of the neural basis of predicting whether a person is going to purchase a product or not. Now, one of the interesting features that we uh, as economists are fascinated with is this interrelationship between immediate and delayed rewards. What I mean by that is that we as human beings tend to have this hyperbolic discounting or this myopic view in which we always put a lot more weight in today than we do into the future. This is why sometimes when we think about the way we act through the day and we say, for example, yes, I'm going to eat that chocolate, that extra piece of chocolate because I'm going to pay for it by going to the gym tomorrow. And by the way, I'm going to start the new regime in, in the gym, but when am I going to start? Tomorrow. And we always postpone the things that, that, we, uh, that we know that we're supposed to do that are optimal for us, but we have that way of always putting that more weight into, into today than we do into the future. So in this, experiment what McClure did was quite interesting because what he offered was people the opportunity to get some money today versus getting a higher amount two weeks later or even an even higher amount a month later and then he observed what happened in the brain and what he saw essentially was that those people who were more impatient that wanted all every everything today tended to have activation in the ventral striata, in the middle of the frontal cortex, and some other areas of the brain that are in the medial part or in the middle of the brain. Now, those individuals who decided to, to wait, uh, 
either the two weeks or the four weeks, the areas of the brain that activated were more in the cortex or in the lateral portions of the brain. And so he started arguing that maybe we had two different systems, one that is more impatient and wants everything today, and one that is a little bit more careful and, uh, and, and analyzes uh, the, the actions, and that maybe the interaction between those two systems is what really determines whether a person buys product or not. Now, since then, this article has been criticized in the sense that they say, if you bring people into the lab, maybe they don't trust that you're going to pay them um, one month later, and they just have this uh, trust issue that you're not accounting for. But that's beyond the point. The point here is that you are starting to see different areas of the brain that are responsible for different type of actions. So in a way, it's not really necessarily just about us taking a decision, but are different areas of the brain that process different things. And so why is this important and why did I give you, did I give you this, uh, this introduction about the, the, the biological parts of the brain in terms of decision making? Well, it's important because for many of us involved in the industry, we're starting to see a, a proliferation of, of branding in, in, uh, in nursery and, and, and in plants in general. And so although we might be far behind other industries that have done this, particularly in food and maybe other areas, I think that most uh, people are starting to see value in, in, in giving this branding. So I want to show you here how is branding processed in the brain. And in this experiment, Nelson and Majors um, essentially gave the same individual so that you didn't have any confounding factors uh, a script. And this person interacted with people that came into the lab. And in one uh, treatment, they had this plain shirt that you can see displayed here on the left. And then in the other treatment, they had the shirt displayed in the right, which is a branded shirt. And then this person was interacted with the individual. And, and, and depending on how this person performed, the individual decided how competent this person was and how much this person was going to be paid per hour. And what they discovered was quite interesting because in the absence of the branded shirt, uh, participants saw the individuals to be uh, okay, but when they were wearing the branded shirt, they perceived the person to be more friendly, to be more competent, and to be more knowledgeable to the point that they even got uh, uh, a remuneration that was higher compared to when they were wearing the non-branded shirt. Remember, there was the exact same people performing the experiment. The only difference is that they were perceived to be uh, using this branded shirt. Now, industries have known this for a long time. And we observe, for example, people particularly in real estate and people involved in, in financial services, they know that their appearance is their brand. And if they're going to sell the idea that they're successful in making money, they have to portray themselves to be successful. And you can, all of us can see that typically these individuals are very well dressed, they drive very nice cars, and they portray this attitude uh, uh, as it relates to branding and prestige. So this is not necessarily new, but we can really infer some of these ideas and try to bring them into the, the green industry. Now, what's really difficult about trying to separate well, how much of this is really because the branding itself versus the prestige, uh, it's, it's tough to do because typically uh, when we look at products that are uh, uh, branded or they're more expensive, they tend to be highly correlated in the sense that higher quality products are usually more expensive. And they also, of course, have a higher quality. So if you think about two watches, a Rolex and a Casio, um, yes, the Rolex is much more expensive, but it also has higher quality. So how do you separate the quality component from the prestige? And that's not really easy to do because some people may argue, no, wait a minute, I buy this product, it's branded, sure, but it's also higher quality, so it would last me longer. And so that argument can be made and it's difficult to separate that. So what Plasman et al. did in this experiment was quite interesting because they were able to separate that. And what they did is essentially they gave individuals who were wine connoisseurs um, two bottles of wine. One bottle of wine was priced at $90 and the other bottle of uh, wine was priced at $10. Now here's the caveat. The bottle of wine was exactly the same. The only difference is that they changed the label 
and they changed the price in one of the bottles. But everything else was exactly the same. Now, you might find interesting that, of course, if you look at the, the tasting uh, results, that the $90 bottle of wine was definitely better than the $10 bottle of wine, according to all the participants. Now, this is an interesting result um, it, because, remember, it's exactly the same bottle of wine. Now, what you might find fascinating is that what they actually did is they, they put people through an fMRI machine and they scan and, and saw what was happening in their brain while they were drinking the wine. And what happened was quite interesting because, as you can see here in this graph, when they tasted the red, I mean, the green uh, uh, label, bottle of wine which is the 90 dollar bottle of wine compared to the blue one that was ten dollars even though it was the exact same wine the medial orbital frontal cortex which is an area of the brain that is typically associated with the pleasantness of of others and and taste uh activated a lot more with the 90 dollar bottle of wine now what this is fascinating because it essentially tells us that we are microbiologically wired to derive pleasure from consuming things that we perceive are prestigious. So it's not just the perception itself, but it's our brain that if we know and we believe that we're consuming something that is more prestigious, our brain convinces us that that's the case. And once the brain convinces us and releases these uh, substances, it's almost as if we leave that reality. And, 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 and you may ask the question, well, I don't know whether there's a difference between what's real and what people perceive. I think that actors, and Oscar winners in particular are really good at this because they convince their brains that they are that person they're playing in these movies and they release the right chemicals so that they actually have the sensations and everything else. So it's a similar concept here in the sense that if our brain is telling us that this bottle is better, even though it's exactly the same, it's activating the regions of the, of the brain that actually provides us with more pleasure. So what we see in a way is what we perceive and what we process in the brain. Now, this is interesting, and to put it in perspective of how today we're using some of these to, uh, to, to showcase that presti prestige, we have to go all the way to Thornstein Bevelin. And he introduced this term, con conspicuous consumption, which essentially means uh, that it is uh, not only the, the mere fact of possessing something, that is not sufficient, whether it's wealth or power, the wealth of power has to be put on ev in evidence because it's only in evidence that we award this uh, uh, prestige or this conspicuous consumption. So if we have a Ferrari, but we keep it in our farm and we never take it out, it might not be the same as if we take it out in, in Fifth Avenue in New York City. There are different connotations as to the term of, of conspicuous consumption. Now, what has changed today is social media. This is something that has really completely revolutionized the way in which we interact socially, and it provides us with a, with a conduit for us to showcase some of the things that we consume. So think about it, you know, whenever somebody receives flowers or they're working in their garden, they feel proud about it, they, they, they showcase, they take a picture, they snapshot it, they show it in Facebook. And of course, this is a way of showcasing that we have. So while I may not be able to observe the, the, the actual life of a person or their income, I observe what they do, how they dress, what vehicles they drive, where do they travel, uh, I observe how, whether they exercise or not, because nowadays people are posting their exercise routes in Facebook. I look at the plates, uh, see how, what they're eating, whether they're eating healthy, they have healthy lifestyles. All of this information that communicates prestige, that communicates what we consume, whether it's food, whether it's other uh, green industry products, is portrayed to social media. And it's important for this con con consumption to exist to be able to showcase that. And so the social media concept is really what's bringing this to life. There might be two different motivations for people to consume uh, prestigious good. One is invidious comparison, where essentially higher class individuals showcase their wealth and power by buying prestigious items. But there's also pecuniary emulation, which what better example than Jack in the movie Titanic, in which he buys prestigious goods in order to signal to others that he belongs to a higher class or that he has higher income than he actually have, has. Now, there is uh, a paper 
by uh, Dubois, Rucker, and Galinsky that has looked at conspicuous consumption in non-luxury goods. And we have also looked into the fact that maybe food even, uh, in particular organic food, is being used as a way to showcase status. And you can, if you're interested in, in reading that, you can Google Applied Economics Fashionable Food and you will be able to find this article in which we argue that because of social media and other things, people are using organic food as a way to showcase social status, not only because of the higher income required to purchase the products that typically are more expensive, but also because it showcases restraint, it showcases they're eating healthy and that you have healthy lifestyles. So all of the these concepts are interesting in the sense that we know that prestige works. It works not only through what we do, but it works through the hard wire of our biological nature in the brain. But it's also important to have this validation that others need to see this. And social validation is quite important because we not always make decisions on our own. If we go into a restaurant and we see that the restaurant is completely empty, maybe that's a signal to us that the food in this restaurant might not be that good. So you can see and appreciate how the decisions of other people actually affect our decisions and we're not making the decisions isolated on our own. So it's important for us to take in consideration this social component. And in this classical experiment conducted in the 50, 50s, what, they, what this uh, person did, Ash, essentially showed people three different lines and one line in particular. And he showed these individuals which of the lines in the right is more similar in length to the to the line to the line on the left either a b or c and what he observed of course that there was less than one percent errors when participants did this but then he hired some actors to be in front of the line of the actual subjects and the actors will say a wrong answer for example c c and then the next actor will say c and the next one will do the same and so on. So when the actual participant came, he faced the question as to whether he wanted to comply with that social validation of what everybody else said, or if he wanted to go with his own decision. And at that point, people had almost 37% errors. What I'm trying to say here is that we in our lives are in many cases willing to forego and commit errors so that we don't appear to be not socially acceptable or socially valid. And this is quite important because it determines which products we buy, how we interact with these products, how we dress, and so on and so forth. And, and, and of course, going back to this issue about people processing, think about a, a consumer getting into a garden center and they are exposed to information about different plants, uh, about different uh, specials, different promotions, uh, different uh, labels, uh, different uh, uh, setups in the in the actual center, and we've always assumed that the more products that we have, uh, the better. Uh, except for maybe a few talks of my friend Charlie, I've, uh, where he argues that it's better to reduce your uh, inventory if you can operate and differentiate your products enough and make it prestigious enough, so that you can actually reduce the inventory and at the same time. Well, even though you reduce your quantity, you might still make more money. Uh, this is kind of like a similar concept, but viewed instead of from the from the supply side, a little bit more into the demand side. What happens to consumers when they get too many options? And in this fascinating experiment, Einger and Leppard conducted this experiment in a grocery store setting, and they brought people into the grocery store. And in one condition, they show them six different flavors of jams. And in the other condition, they repeated the exact same experiment, but instead of six, they showed them 24 uh, flavors of jams. They took out the traditional strawberry and blueberry and some of the very well-known flavors. And then they gave individuals a coupon so they can go to the jam section and buy any jam they wanted to. Now, of course, what happened was that there went more variety with the 24 flavors. A lot more people stopped by to the tasting booth. They tasted the products. They generate a lot of interest. But at the end of the day, only 3% of them purchased products. On the other hand, when there were only six flavors, there was less people that stopped by, but those who stopped actually ended up buying. And so that the conversion rate into sales was much, much higher. And so this is interesting because it shows that maybe, maybe having too much inventory, too many products, 
might not necessarily translate into having more sales. And 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 industries have started started to use this concept for different things. And now you can see restaurants that, for example, have reduced the number of plates to the point that maybe there's some restaurants here in Texas, in particular in Austin, where you go and you have either two options for what you're going to eat, or it's the chef selection in which you you just go, you pay a fixed amount, and the chef decides what you're going to eat. Guess what? When you look at how satisfied people are with the environment, with the friendliness of the waiters, with the quality of the foods, people seem to go out much more happier when they have less options to choose than they we have many options. Perhaps because when we go into a typical restaurant, we order something and then we see what everybody else order and we have more things to regret not ordering for ourselves. But this also has been used in financial services. And the point I'm trying to make here is that the consumers are so, uh, the cognitive ability is so much limited when they go through that the easier we can make it for them to make the decision, the better. So we want to make sure that we provide them with information that is simple to process, easy to read, and make it easy for them to uh, to make their decisions. Yeah, that's, good. Look- that's a, a tremendous application in, in our industry, Marco, in terms of yeah, the number of SKUs that we have today versus 20 years ago, we're much more prolific in terms of generating new plant products, whether it be shrubs, trees, or flowers. And we're, we're very good at adding SKUs. We have a, a, a spring trials in which we're adding three or 400 bedding plant varieties every year. And yet we don't eliminate that many SKUs. And so we have a a kind of a skew proliferation that's occurred and we need to do a better job of when we add skews we need to figure out which ones are are uh, eligible to be eliminated from our inventory as you just said and th- that's a great point uh, in particular if you look at the limited amount of time and cognitive ability that consumers have uh, it's difficult for them to evaluate all of these different varieties and that brings me to my next point here of an experiment that was conducted in terms of cognitive ability and poverty. But the, 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 the idea here is that when you have limited resources or you constrain into something and you're continuously thinking about that, that results in suboptimal decisions. So in this particular experiment, they ask individuals to think of a scenario in which the car had broken down and they will have to incur in $150 in repairs to, to make the, the change. And what they discovered, of course, was that there was no difference in the cognitive ability of rich and poor people to perform this task. However, when they repeated the exact same task, and instead of being uh, $150 for repairs, well, it was 1,500. Just the fact that poor people were thinking about the financial resources and their mind was completely full in terms of the cognitive ability was reduced, which is the point I'm trying to make here, they significantly reduce their cognitive ability. So when we go, human beings are not really designed to multitask and to to, um, use information in, in, in several different ways. So how much can we multitask? Let me show you this video that we uh, recorded from a subject in in uh, in our lab, actually, this was in a field application in South by Southwest. But but the the point here is that the individual is supposed to count the number of times that the girls in the green shirt jump the rope. And then I have here the activity in the brain, in particular in the prefrontal cortex, as they do this task, as this individual does the task. Uh, so if you want to follow along, you can actually try to count the number of times that the girls jumped the rope. Uh, and so I'm gonna start the video here. So you can see the attention. We have an eye tracking device. The eye tracking device shows what the person is looking at. You saw that originally this person was looking at the feet. So it probably tells us that the person was counting the number of jumps, but then he's looking at the face. And uh, when looking at the face, of course, there's no way in which the person is counting the number of jumps. Now he's going to start counting again, and you can see the activity in the brain to start to jump up in terms of the cognitive ability. And so you can see here an example of how the eye tracking can match what's happening in the brain. Now what's interesting about this is that this person was counting the number of times the girls were jumping. You can look at the activity happening in the brain, how the person when they were using 
their full attention to do so, uh, the activity in the brain increased. But more importantly, if you were following along and trying to count, we asked this person, how many times did the person uh, jump the rope? And if you said 42, you would be right. But the point is, while your attention is diverted to that, you might have missed a chicken that went through the back. And so we asked people, you know, did you see the chicken that went into the back? Of course, if they counted, they didn't see the chicken. And very few individuals uh, saw the chicken. We had a few people that actually said, yes, I saw the chicken. So we asked them a question, did you see the monkey in the back? Of course, there was no monkey and just wanted to separate those individuals who would just say, yeah, 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 of course, I think I remember seeing it uh, from those who actually see. The point here is that individuals, people are not really made to multitask. And so think about how can you reduce the transaction cost for people uh, to make the, the purchases. So you want to make sure that you make it easy for them, that you make it salient, because we're not really designed to process this multitasking. And so there are a lot that happens that we want to do. We have these good resolutions, uh, but, but then we also have the brain uh, hardwired that happens in terms of interfering with that. Now, there are different ways in which people might be able to cope or consumers might be willing to cope and sticking with different things. Uh, and these are known as commitment devices. The oldest commitment devices being the story of Homer's uh, in the Odyssey, Homer's Odyssey and where Odysseus wanted to see um, the sirens while he was sailing. And of course, the problem was that when, when people got near them, uh, they were slaying them and they will crash into the rocks and everybody will die. And so he devised this plan in which he put bee wax in the ears of his tripulation, and then he asked them to tie him to the mast tail. And when they do so, he said, no matter what I tell you, don't untie me. So this is the oldest form of a commitment device because you're already committed to an action and there's no way in, in which you can change that. So people are using these, uh, something as simple as setting deadlines or uh, committing to make some savings, for example, is another way uh, in which people actually incur in a cost uh, to, to save money. And this experiment, late, David Lafson essentially gave people the opportunity to save in three different types of accounts. One was a typical account in which people could withdraw their money at any point with, without any penalty. And then he also offered people the opportunity to say, well, you can put your, your money in this other account in which if you want to withdraw any amounts, you have to pay penalty fee of 15% or 25%. And essentially, why will a rational person decide to how to impose a, co a cost to withdraw their own money? Because they do want to save. And so that, that's the point here is that this type of commitment devices might be useful when people make decisions. This is an interesting example here, the kitchen safe. Uh, these safes uh, have a timer and they will not open until the time is done. And so you can think about the applications for this for uh, restraining from eating or playing, or if you, have, if you have already had too much to drink, you have to wait until you can drive, credit cards, uh, quit smoking, or think about how much productive we can be if we locked our phones and we dedicated more time to do some of the things that we really need to do. Now, one of the last things I want to show here is that Sometimes we really want to change, but because we put a lot of weight into today and we normally lack imagination. So in addition to making it easy for people to process things and make it uh, easy for them cognitively easily, easy, we also need to help the consumers imagine themselves having and raging those, those benefits from the products that we produce. So it's not only about having the products, but it's all also about showing people, number one, what those products will look like in the future, and also how will they benefit from those products. So you can show the shade, and I think that uh, my friend Charlie has done a very good job of, of putting together some of the non-tangible or non-traditional benefits of, of green industry products. So how can we match this to show people how they will reap these benefits in the future? And if you go all the way back to Charles Dickens, remember that Ebenezer Scrooge was visited by three ghosts, the ghost of Christmas past. And essentially when that happened, he got melancholic and, and, and sad, but he didn't really change his actions in the present. 
he, the same happened when the ghost of Christmas present visited him, but it was only when the ghost of Christmas future um, visited him that he changed his present. So what I want to emphasize here is that we need to show these individuals when they come into a garden center, they might look at the plant, but they don't see the full potential of what the plant would look like uh, a few months later or even a few years later if they're buying something uh, that, that, that grows for a long period of time. So this process of imagination really translates into sales. And so several studies have shown that even imagining the scenario makes people more likely to take uh, positive action, whether that is saving for vacation or uh, saving more for retirement, for example. In these other experiments, they show people what they would look like in the future, and they showed a happy face if in the future um, the same person that was progressively aged uh will save enough for retirement then your future self will be happy but if not uh the, the your future self might be sad because you will not have enough money for retirement the point is that we need to communicate these benefits and facilitate the cognitive processing and facilitate the imagination of the interaction of the of the consumers with the products so in doing that we have a plethora of different things that we can emphasize depending on the products that we're doing and depending on on the type of benefits that we want to communicate. So these are the type of questions that we're doing in the human behavior lab that started as, as, a, as really something that my, my two friends and colleagues, Luis Rivera and Charlie Hall and I, as a way to try to understand some of the biological process. And what we have in the lab, and we are also capable of doing applications in the real world, is uh, we have eye tracking devices so we can monitor the attention uh, and, uh, of people, what is it that they're looking at, whether it's in a computer setting or in a real setting or even in virtual reality settings, we're starting to do some work related to that. But we also recognize that people might look into something because they are they like it or maybe because they dislike it. And so we also include other things related to using uh, facial expressions. And we have uh, a package that we use that looks at the movement of the muscles on in the face and it correlates that with emotional so we not only know what people are looking at but we know how they react emotionally while they're doing that we're also capable of looking at some stressors uh, like a galvanic skin response so we can monitor uh, the conductivity in the skin we can monitor heart rates uh, respiration rates so we know how stressed or how people are reacting emotionally to something and of course we have the activity in the brain that tells us how people process these different stimuli and so in different experiments we've showed people real products and in these real products you can see one subject here participating they're actually making a real purchase here in the sense that they're looking at the product and they were and down with a five with five dollars and whether they, they decided whether they wanted to keep the five dollars or purchase the product they were looking at and underneath what you see is the reaction in terms of the emotions and also the brain in engagement but we also post process this to look at just the activity in the brain and looking at by looking at how the activity in the brain might determine the, the probability of purchase. And it turns out that, for example, in this experiment that people were facing two different options, just by looking at what happens in the brain, we can very accurately predict from about 76 to 80 percent uh, correct rate whether they will end up buying a product. And in this case, we can accurately predict which of the two products that we're going to select. So we're getting to that stage in which we're matching some of what the whys or why are people doing what they're doing what are the behavioral processing processes they're using to decide whether to purchase or not but we're also using some of the neoclassical economic concepts to try to measure these uh utility or these benefits directly by looking at the brain and we're actually being able to to predict very well how, whether people are going to end up buying something so i think that the future of what we want to show you here is that we are interested in not only using some of the traditional methods that that the that Charlie and I and Bridge and many others in the industry have used. These are really good. We're not saying here that we need to change those, not in any way. What we think might happen in the near future is that we might be using some of these technologies to try to better understand the behavioral process 
and that in combination with this uh, equipment, we might be able to better understand how and why is it that consumers do what they do? What is really bringing their visual appeal, the visual attention? How do they engage emotionally? What happens in the brain when they look at these activities? And how does that result in terms of uh, acceptance and, and willingness to purchase and, and willingness to pay for different uh, products? Importantly, we're not restricted to uh, lab uh, laboratory conditions. We can do these in real settings. So here I have uh, the um, experimental gardens of Dayburn. Uh, we have a project together looking at how to breed uh, roses that are uh, resistant to rose rosette. And so in this particular project, we're interested in looking at how people process different roses. So they're walking across these uh, trials and, and looking at what consumers pay attention to. So we have different settings that we can, we can actually uh, uh, make. And so I think that with this, we are about 45 minutes into it. And so I'm going to, to stop here uh, the website, if you're interested in, in finding out more about the lab, is hbl.tamu.edu. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, uh, Marco, ac excellent job. That is uh, that's fascinating things uh, to, to hear about in terms of the way people think and how it influences their purchasing decisions. So we got a couple of questions. So one of those questions was, has there been any work in the food or, or green industry area that you've already done that would apply to us today? Yes, we have. So we have conducted different type of experiments looking at, uh, number one, trying to predict whether a person is going to, to purchase products. We've looked into how people search for information in labels. Uh, we, so we have a good understanding of not only what features in a label people actually look at, but we know, for example, how different formats of the information influence whether a person pays attention to something and whether that they use this information and consider this into buying. So you can think about different type of, of projects that we're typically involved in. One is how do people react to different promotional campaigns, whether the promotions are advertising videos or maybe the promotions are just fixed um, posters, fixed uh, features in the label. And we can see how different packaging information, label information um, drives the attention of consumers. How do they react emotionally to those labels and how do, does that impact the, their decision to, to purchase the products or not? And so this is an area that we've continuously trying to um, to, to do more and more work in, in, in industry products. Uh, one of the things that we look at, for example, is are there any differences? We sometimes put a lot of attention into developing very high quality products. And there is a big difference in how the experts perceive quality to how the typical average consumer might perceive quality. And so one of the things that, that we're investing some time in trying to study is, are there any difference between the regular consumer and does the cost of providing this higher quality really uh, justifies the, uh, the benefits in terms of the increased willingness to pay? In other words, we put a lot of attention into having this perfect orange or the perfect rose. Uh, do people actually care if the rose has some small blemish damages that were produced by an insect? And it might be different for uh, green industry products than it is for food. And so there's a lot of work that we're dedicating to look at this trade-off between the quality and the, the, the perceived price, particularly as it relates to consumers in the green industry and in, in the food industries. Yeah, while you were uh, mentioning that, Marco, I was... I was just uh, looking through the attendee list, and I noticed that we've got a couple, uh, well, three of our colleagues are on as well, uh, Dr. Bridget Behe and Dr. Pat Huddleston from Michigan State, and then uh, Dr. Hype Katatrian from University of Florida. And, of course, they've been uh, team members along with us on several of these projects, and it, it brought to mind some of the other things that we've worked on. And just uh, you know, th some of the things that come top of my mind is the fact that We've looked at local and organic and sustainable labels and, and found that uh, particularly 
uh, local and organic labels have a, a stronger willingness to pay associated with them, but local even more so than, than organic with some consumers. And we've looked at water conservation issues and the fact that uh, uh, a smaller amount of water may have been used to produce a particular plant that, that can influence willingness to pay, but also how much water the plant uses in the landscape. And that's one of the projects that's still ongoing. And then uh, I'm reminded of, of some of Dr. Behe's work on price signage and where, where the price sign is in the display can affect um, how often that consumers are looking at that price sign and how much that influences their likelihood to purchase. And so some of that's been reported in the, in the trade media. And then uh, some of uh, Dr. Katchatrian's work at Florida uh, on foliage plants, uh, you know, he looked at uh, whether it made a difference, whether plants were local or organic, or uh, whether there was some messaging about the fact that foliage plants help scrub volatile organic compounds, and uh, found that those those three things do influence likelihood to purchase, and that um, we've seen all together that the sustainableness and and I think more aptly put, the health benefits uh, do influence likelihood to purchase and willingness to pay. And um, um, yeah, one other thing that just comes to mind is the fact that the, the more that a person resonates on the plant or the flower itself, the more likely they are to purchase. So those are just some of the things that come uh, top of mind on some of our previous research projects uh, using this eye tracking technology and, and now moving into this biometrics uh, realm, we'll, have a, uh, we'll be able to even further investigate the mind of the consumer. So it's quite exciting. I, I think that's a great point, and I'm glad that you brought some of the work of our friends and colleagues around the country because I think that this is a trend that is here to stay and that will enrich the type of information and the type of research that we do. And even though we've only been doing this for a couple of years, um, I think we're almost on a level feel in the sense that these technology is so new that it's 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 starting to become useful in many industries and of course i look forward to collaborating with some of our colleagues in terms of discovering some of these uh new uh areas and how you know we can better understand what the consumer does particularly in agriculture and particularly in food and and in the green industry and we have one more question marco that came up uh, just now do these findings apply to business to business customer buying habits as well? Absolutely, I think that they do. There's a lot of work that is being done in the business to business area in terms of coordination and how people get into different type of relationships, um, how uh, uh, people uh, uh, reach an agreement in different areas and how this uh, trust information is translated, What what really facilitates the communication, uh, personnel management in general, uh, and, and also related to uh, different ways of, of portraying uh, different company environments and how these different ways of paying, for example, your workers might translate into uh, productivity. Uh, we have conducted experiments uh, recently that we have looked at how the way in which you might pay your uh, employees might induce them to increase their persistence and then their output but if you are looking into industries where people are supposed to use rather than just the brute force of making widgets or if they're just fabricating something that is mechanical and we know that if you provide better incentives um, that people are going to become more productive but also what happens if you frame those incentives differently from a positive and negative domain so instead of providing people with uh, for example bonuses if they achieve certain issues if you provide them with different type of incentive structure now how is it different if people are supposed to be more creative and they're supposed to be coming up with marketing and different type of media messages to sell products that might be very different than just uh, trying to provide individuals with incentives. So these are the type of questions that relate to more business structure type of situations that we're also undertaking trying to study and also as it, as it relates to the business to business um, activities. Awesome. 
Well, folks, I, we're nearing the end of our time, and, and uh, Marco, you've answered uh, all the questions that have come in. There's been others, but they all pertain to some of the things that you just uh, were talking about. So uh, thank you very much, Marco. I will mention that uh, Dr. Palma will be at the Cultivate Conference, and as well as Dr. B. He and Dr. Katsatrian, so and and myself. So if you if you have any other questions and you're there and you see us, by you know grab us and talk about some of the research that that we've done and how that might apply to your individual situation. So Marco, thanks so much for your time and the information today. It was outstanding. I'll remind folks that as I close out the uh, the webinar today. You'll be sent to the evaluation page. And if you can fill that out in about 46 seconds, that'd be awesome. So thank you, Marco, and thank you all for being here and talk to you soon.